Welcome to another episode of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. I hope you're all doing well. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for the feedback on uh, last week's show, the first one in the studio with BBF chair Ed Warner. Um, as you all know, if you've listened to it, uh, the audio wasn't great. He was a little bit too far away from the mic and that is something that I'm continuing to iterate and improve on hopefully over time. But unfortunately, I need, do need to tell you in this quick intro, the audio was not as good as it could have been. Uh, I ended up messing up as I get my head around this uh, the, the new technical equipment. Um, and unfortunately, I selected the input from my laptop, not the mics. Uh, so you should hear quite a difference in sound quality between this introduction and the actual interview. And that will explain why. Um, I have messed with the levels a little bit. So, it, I mean, you can hear it. It's just not as great quality as it could be. Um, so, yeah, like hopefully that will be the last time I do that. And over time, uh, the quality should continue to improve. Before we do get into the show, um, as always, do need to do a quick sponsorship message. Uh, if you like and support and value the work that we're doing with Hoops Fix, please consider supporting us on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com forward slash Hoops Fix, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Hoops Fix. On there is a um, it's a supporters website to be able to support the creators that you uh, that you want. Uh, it allows us to go directly to our audience, to you, um, and ask if you would be willing to give as small or as little, little or as much as you'd like every single month to help support the work that we do so that we can become 100% independent and sustainable and not have to rely on freelance contracts um, and other methods of income to be able to sustain our work. So yeah, check it out. And if you would uh, be willing to support us, it would be hugely, hugely appreciated. Anyway, this week's show is with BBL MVP, uh, London Lions and GB guard Justin Robinson. Uh, he has been on the wanted list for so long. He's been requested by a lot of people. Um, and it's someone that I really, really enjoy talking to. Um, we spoke about his career all the way from the early days in Brixton uh, through until now. So, yeah, there's a lot of interesting insight, which I think a lot of people can get um, a ton of value from. So, yeah, have a listen. Let me know what you think. As always, you can email me, sam at hoopsfix.com. Um, reach, me out on, reach out to me on all social media platforms at hoopsfix. Uh, and if you do have a quick second, you can get onto iTunes and give us a rating and review. It would be hugely appreciated to help us continue to spread the podcast far and wide. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Um, and yeah, you can find us on all the other platforms uh, and would love to hear from you. So yeah, that's enough from me. Uh, here is this week's show with me and Justin Robertson. <laughs> Justin, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. Uh, obviously, been in practice this morning. Um, you know how how's it going with London Lions this season? Let's let's talk about this year. Yeah. Um, so far, it's going okay. Um, well, we five and one now. I think um, we gave up a stupid loss to Plymouth, um, which hopefully won't come back to haunt us. Um, but I mean, it's cool so far. You know, um, I think the guys are still. Trying to figure each other out, you know, um, trying to get that on court chemistry. But um, it's cool, I mean, you know, everyone gets along, everyone's hungry, um, everyone's on the same page, and we're just trying to win, man. So, so far, so good. You know, we spoke about this, uh, I think it was your first, first time game of the season when I came down. Um, but it kind of felt like London Lions were, went a little bit under the radar this off season. Obviously, they made some moves and signed a couple uh, really good players. Um, meanwhile, your 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 rivals uh, south of the river have been getting all the love. Um, you know, do you feel at all that lines have been overlooked a little bit coming into this season? Um, I wouldn't really say overlooked. I mean, for a lot of people, you know, the new team starting up is exciting. You know, um, obviously, back in the day, there was a team in Crystal Palace. London Towers, you know, um, uh, London City Royals have come back and they kind of filled that void, you know. Um, so I think a lot of people are excited about that. But, I mean, me personally, I, I don't see it as being overlooked. Um, I, I just think people are excited about the, the potential of, of London City Royals, you know, which is fair, you know. Um, a lot of big names and big signings and a lot of um, people that they're um, used to or you know, familiar with that are involved, you know, so, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't really take it personally, you know, it's just it's sports, you know, so. Obviously, you, uh, you re-signed with London um, before the announcement of the, of the Royals franchise. Do you think that there would have been any chance that we would have seen you uh, soon up with the Royals if you hadn't signed with the Lions already? Um, the, the, the chance, I mean, I mean. I mean, a lot of those guys are your boys, right? Yeah, I mean. But, you know, I'm not a person that I don't sign because my boys are on the team, you know. Um, I, I sign where I'm comfortable. And um, I think for me, you know, the, the first year was a good year. Um, 
a lot of unfinished business, you know. Um, you know, we got to the finals and we lost, we came up short. And there's a, there's, there's a lot of things that I haven't achieved yet, you know. So, I mean, I think it would be a, the easy way out or a cop out just to jump ship, you know. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable where I am, you know. Um, obviously, at the end of the day, it's still a business, you know. And, you know, you know, when you start talking about contracts and, you know, the money involved, that changes things. But, I mean, as of now, I'm comfortable, you know. Um, so cool. me, me and Vince got a great understanding, you know. We've got a really good relationship. So, I mean, you know, let's say if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know. So, yeah. You know, talking about that transition for you to come home last year, it was it was big news to have you know you back, and I think um, it'd be fair to say on some level you're one of the the first sort of British stars to come home. Um, you know, why did you decide to come home? Uh, what were the factors that that sort of uh, made that decision? Um, I mean, it's tough, man. I mean, a lot of people don't understand that when you're always away from your family and friends, you know, you you kind of isolated, you know. Um, like I've been away since I was sixteen, so that's like almost half my life, you know. Um, so like being in Europe, you know, being in a different country, you know, you, you're not always treated the right way, you know. Sometimes you might not get paid on time, you know, all these things that that um, players go through in Europe. And also, you know, I've got two young kids, you know, my son's three and my daughter's one. So, you know, going up and down every year, I'm leaving them, and you know that that whole emotional thing you know at the airport crying because your son's screaming his head off you know um it's too much you know and i just thought it's time to come home and get my life started man you know start trying to get a mortgage start paying taxes you know just becoming a normal civilian if you want to call it like that you know start setting up things for long term and off the court you know so when you're away you're kind of out of sight out of mind you know you can't really do anything you know um so i, I just thought it was a, a great time and vince came at a time where you know, um, we were kind of thinking the same thing, but he approached me and, you know, he put forth a good, a good offer. So, you know, I decided to take it, yeah. When you, when you came into the league, uh, you know, obviously we know now that you ended up as MVP. Um, I, I think that was the, probably the story of the year uh, last season for sure. Um, did you think that that was a potential possibility coming in? Was it on your mind at all? Was it, uh, and then when you, when you found out, was it a complete surprise? Um... To be honest, it, it, it really wasn't on my mind at all. I mean, um, in my mind, I was trying to win a championship. Um, anyone that knows me, they know that I don't really play for personal accolades and I don't really like the attention or spotlight. Um, I just, just tried to play, man. You know, just play in the flow of the offense, help my teammates and just, just play good basketball. And out of that, you know, I happened to be named... MVP. Um, it also helped that we finished in second place, in, you know, which was their highest, um, highest finish in, who knows. Um, but when they told me, I, I actually got a call on the way back from Glasgow. We beat Glasgow um, on the road in the semi-finals. And someone from the BBL called me and they were like, oh, you know, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, blah, 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 blah. And then at, at the end of it, he was like, oh, um, just want to let you know that you're MVP. And then, I think he ex- expected me to be excited yeah. and like get all gassed and I was like, okay. <laughs> it didn't really mean nothing to me, you know. Um, and that's not, that's not to um, disrespect, disrespect it, it, it yeah, yeah. or downplay anything, but, you know. You're about winning. Yeah. You won the mean, titles. We went to the final and we lost, you know, um, convincingly. So all that other stuff is, is, is irrelevant, you know. It's, um, to me, it's just, it's just a void award, you know. Obviously, I'm grateful and you know, I'm I'm appreciative that people voted for me and the coaches voted for me and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, if you don't win nothing, it's it's, it's pointless. You know, I mean that's just my mentality and, and the way I was brought up. So, you know, coming back to the UK, um, you know, I'm sure you probably had a perception of the league before you joined it. Um, you know, people tend to enjoy jumping on it and criticizing it. Uh, I've done plenty of criticism in my in the past as well. So I'm you know I'm, I'm one of them. Um, you know, how, in, in terms of your perception coming in, how did the actual reality meet your perception? Were there things you were pleasantly surprised about? Were there things you were actually disappointed about? Um, kind of, yeah, marry the two, talk about kind of the differences. Um, I'll be honest, like, before I signed, you know, growing up, you said, oh, BBL, you know, I, I don't want to ever see you in the BBL and, or, or not until you're an old man and blah, blah, blah. 
So coming in, I, I didn't think the level would be that high, but I was actually surprised with how high the level was. You know, um, obviously it's not as high as some of the other league, Greece, France, Turkey, all those countries. But you know, a lot of people sleep on the BBL and they think that when they come here, it's just going to be a cakewalk, and it's it's, it's not that. You know, um, the one thing that I was disappointed with is just like just the, the whole how I put it, man, like the management of the league, like the whole like the scheduling, and then. Like players will play like back to backs and then not have a game for two weeks. It's just it's just like there's no organization. It's just a random schedule. Like for example, we might play like for example, we played Glasgow twice and we haven't played majority of the league. You know, it's just it's just not very smart. You know, like in other leagues, you have a a round one and the next round is the same order and the third round the same order and then playoffs will be the best of three. You know, come on, like you can't have a game where you're having a tied score in basketball, you know, we tied with Glasgow in the first round and people across the world are like, what the hell is this? A tied score, you know, so it just, it just needs some little tweaks and, and I'm not sure who's at the top of the the food chain in the BBL, but, you know, it, it, it looks like the people don't really know about basketball, you know, and how it should run, you know, so it's small things, you know, it's not anything too major, but, I mean, once those things are ironed out and, you know, we can start getting that respect from other leagues and start progressing, you know. I think, yeah, I think a lot of that is down to the facilities. Ultimately, it comes oh. down to actually getting the venues. Oh. Um, I think there's a there's a lot of difficulties around the obviously availability. And when I think when we get to a place, obviously Eagles have got their arena coming up. Oh. Leicester have got theirs. You know, Worcester. There's places now that have got their own, and that's changing things. Oh. Um, but it still needs the rest of the league to be in in the yeah. same situation. You know, I know that obviously at the Copper Box, you'll have times when there's big events and yeah. <laughs> Vince can't get in there, yeah. um, and you can't have a game for for whatever reason, and you've got to do it you know, on a random day. Um, so, yeah, there are struggles for sure. Um, no, I agree with that. Are you, um, I mean, are you pretty set here now? Are you thinking you're going to be in the UK for the rest of your career? Like, Yeah, I mean, like I said, I've got a young son, young daughter, um, and to leave now would be like, it would be traumatic for them. You know, like, <laughs> I used to see him every day, waking up, seeing me, taking my son to nursery, picking him up. Um, I mean, unless I get a crazy offer, like, 20,000 a month from Saudi Arabia, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, it, it, it's just not feasible, you know, and they'd have to, the pros and cons would have to outweigh each other crazy, you know, so, yeah. but yeah. Uh, you know, obviously I follow you on social media, you know, and I see that you're very much a family man, mm-hmm. um, you know, how, how much has that changed your approach to life, uh, having kids, uh, your approach to basketball, your approach to your career? Um, how would you say your, your mindset is, uh, whether it's changed from before and, and now? Um, I think for me, it's just, I'm just starting to see things, how can I put it? I'm starting to do things for my kids, you know. Um, like I don't really care about myself, if that makes sense. Obviously, I care about myself, but <laughs> everything I'm doing is trying to put things in place so when they're, of, of age, you know, they can grow up and they can have things or savings or whatever, properties, you know, um, they're just, just trying to have a better childhood than, than I had, you know, um, so when they get to an age, it's not like, oh, what do I do now? It can be, oh, you know, my dad's set this up for me and I've got options, you know, I can go this way or that way, um, but yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's just, it's, it's just helped me become more focused, really, um, more de- determined, um, and this, this, this helped me to work harder. Yeah, you know, like just to know that I've got two little human beings depending on me, you know. So, yeah. I want to rewind right back to the start. Uh, you know, I'd love to kind of go through your career from day one. Um, and I guess, you know, the well, the earliest place to start is your upbringing, um, where you were raised. We know you're a very proud Brixton boy. Um, so can you talk about kind of where you grew up, what it was like growing up, and, and then I guess the transition into how you first picked up a basketball? Um, I'm from Cowley Estate. It's um, obviously in Brixton. Um, what can I say? I mean, tough area. I mean, especially back then, you know, um, what's that like? Early mid nineties, late two, uh, late nineties, early two thousands. You know, when Brixton was had a big rep, and you know, um, people used to say this and say that. I mean, it was tough. It was tough. Um, you know, a lot of drugs, crime. You name it, you know. I mean, I don't have a story that's special, like like no one else has been through it. You know what I'm saying? So I ain't gonna sit here and say, "Oh, I've had the hardest life," you know. Um, but you know, it was tough. But at the same time, you know, we we had that community. You know, like the whole estate, everyone knew each other. Um, 
you know, you got your mum's friends, you know, your older brothers, um, his friends, you know, so it was kind of like a big community, even though, you know, all of us, we were all poor, you know, we can't afford this, can't afford that. We had each other, you know, I had my, my brother and my sister, you know, my mum was there, you know, my dad was down the road in Stockwell. Um, so, I mean, as bad as it was, you know, we still had each other and it was a, I mean, the way I look at it, I had a great childhood. Um, you know, you know, going outside, playing, not down ginger, you know, the, you know, the normal thing that, you know, you do growing up, you know, obviously there's, there's stuff that has happened, you know, friends died, friends, I mean, my best friend's in jail for life, you know, um, you know, in your own family, you know, you have like people, drugs or selling drugs or whatever, but, you know, at the same time, you know, these things happen in this life, you know, um, you go through phases, you go through things and it's just, you just got to be, um, strong-minded enough just not to get caught in the trap, you know, um, and not get pulled in by society as such, you know, and, and uh, I mean, for me, I always had that mentality, like, I'm going to be someone, you know, like, there's no way I'm going to end up like so-and-so or like so-and-so, um, and I use a lot of older people in my area as examples, like, you know, I can't, can't end up like him or I can't do what he's doing, and it wasn't until... I think it was like my seventh or eighth birthday. My older brother bought me a, um, a Michael Jordan poster, and um, like I had watched basketball before, but I wasn't really crazy about it. So he bought me the poster, and I was like, "Oh, okay." So I started watching it, and then I used to go out on my estate, me and my friends, basketball, shoot against the wall, shoot against anything you could find. You know, we were using as a basket, um, and then yeah, and then my dad, I think he kind of saw. Okay, okay, like he's interested in this, you know, he loves this. Um, I'm in the house driving my mum crazy, you know, friend of friend, friend the wall, friend of ball off walls and stuff. So he took me down to Brixton and um yeah. I mean I never forget my first day when I walked in. Um you know the main doors when you walk in? Yeah. And there's two court like that court closest to the door, we walk in and Jimmy's standing right there and we walk over, my dad's it was almost like um you know like Tom and Jerry where you, where you don't see that the um that lady's face. Yeah. Like, like, I just remember keeping my head down because I was so scared, so nervous. And my dad was talking to Jimmy and I could just hear his, his, his deep voice like, and he's like, oh, okay. My dad's like, yeah, you know, my son's interested, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, okay, come back on a Wednesday. Yeah, it was, it was a Friday, so come back on a Wednesday. And then came back on a Wednesday and then, yeah, the rest is, is history. And then ever, ever since then, you kind of just get sucked in, you know, you know, with the whole sense of community, you know, one big family, you got the older boys, the older girls treating you like the younger brother or their, or, or their child, you know, so it, it, it's, just, it's hard to even put into words, you know, that, that whole that whole dynamic of the old Brixton Top Cats, but yeah, that was since then. So were you, the first time you joined the Top Cats, that was when you were seven or eight? Or I was eight, yeah. You were eight, eight, wow. Yeah, um, yeah I think eight, ten, nine, or something like that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously, um, you know, I mentioned to you beforehand that, that I, you know, I'd love to talk about Jimmy. Yeah. Um, you know, he tragically passed away a couple of weeks ago now. Um, obviously, a huge part of your life and massively, massively influential on in your career. Yeah. Um, you know, what what would you say about sort of your relationship with him and, and you know, things that he taught you or showed you um, kind of over the years? I mean, boy, it's hard to even put into words, you know, Um I mean, Jimmy was like, boy, I mean, it's hard, man. You know, I mean, it's, it's hard to even describe it, you know. Um, but we was, we was very, very, very close. Um, always in constant con- con- uh, constant contact. Um, he, he was in America. He came to my graduation. He flew out. He told me he was coming. I was like, oh, whatever, man. He's just talking. And then when the whole tour, he just pulled up in a cab and just jumped up. All, all my family started laughing and... But yeah, I mean, always in contact. Um, even when I was in America, when I was in Europe, always call me, send an email, and it, it, it was always um, like he always had the answers. If that makes sense, you know, like when you speak to someone, he he had the ability to kind of. I mean, I'm only speaking for myself. I can't speak for everyone. He had the ability to make me feel like everything was fine. Like, don't worry about it. It's gonna be cool. Um, and I, I think the biggest thing I learned from him is. Like growing up, he, he kind of installed that, um, how can I put it, like a militant mindset, you know, like nothing can stop you. Like no matter what it is, you can do it, you know, like 
a lot of people in Brixton, we say that it, if there's a brick wall, we'll, we'll run through it. You know, that's kind of what he taught us. He kind of, he just pushes you mentally like, and, and physically to the edge where you want to quit. Like, there's so many times I've been, I go home and tell my mom, ah, oh, I forget Brixton, I'm going back there, blah, 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 Jimmy this, Jimmy that. And then the next day, you're, you're back there. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, it was, it, it, yeah, man, it was, it, like I said, it's, it's tough to even put it into words, but he, he was he was everything, man. You know what I'm saying? Everything. Every, everything to me. Um, just as a person, as a coach, as a friend, as a mentor, father figure, you know. Um, I mean, without him, who knows where I'd be? Dead, prison, homeless, who, who knows, you know what I'm saying? On drugs, you know. So, I mean, in terms of basketball, I, I, I owe everything to him. You know, everything. You know, like he 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 definitely lit that fire underneath me, you know. Um a lot of people just say, Oh, you know, you're too small, you can't go to America, you're this and that, but you know. It's funny because I haven't told a lot of people this but when um when a scout came to see Matt uh Matthew Bryan, scout from Yukon, came to see Matt. He, he wanted a big man and a guard, but he wanted a big man, he didn't really come for the guard. So uh, Matt and his and his mum were there meeting the guy and Jimmy just dragged me along, told my mum to come and just like basically like interrupted the meeting, I was like, okay, we got a guard here and basically like forced him <laughs> to find me a school. Like it, it's ask Matthew, he'll tell you. Like I wasn't supposed to go, you know what I'm saying? Like I was good enough to go, but there was nothing set up for me to go to America. He just like sat down and was like, Okay, you got him a school, but what about him now? You know, that's the type of guy. He was, you know, and and that's the belief he had in me, man. And to be honest, it's it's a hard time for me um, mentally, just trying to get over it, you know. Emotionally, I've been all over the place, you know. Um, but I know him; he wouldn't want me or us to to mourn and you know and cry and stuff, you know. Which is nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with crying, but man, I know he 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 want me to use this as fuel, you know, and just keep persevering and keep working hard you know so yeah yeah for sure I mean it's it's been incredible for me watching um you know as, as somewhat of an outsider um to the Brixton Top Cats family over the last couple of weeks and the outpouring of, of love for him and um and everything else has just been I mean you just realize the legacy and the impact that he has will go on for for so long um so long uh are there any particular stories um that stick out in your mind when you think of Jimmy uh, whether it's whether it be a lesson, whether it be um, I don't know something that kind of yeah has resonated with you and you carry carry with you today. Um, I never forget. I mean, to be honest, there's so many stories, but yeah, I don't want to say people's names and yeah, you know, embarrass people and. But I remember flat like, for me, um, I never forget. I was I think I was about twelve years old, and we we had a cadet game which is like under 16 but back in the day, was at Space. And um, the next game after us was, I think it was, it was under 16, yeah, under 16, no, sorry, under 18 game. And obviously they had all the older guys. So it was Brixton versus White Heat, which was like a huge rivalry back then. And I remember after the cadet game, everyone went home, but Jimmy told me to stay there. So I was out there. And back then, if anyone knew me, I was tiny. I was like, a midget, um, and he said, "No, I see bit, uh, like you're staying." So I'm like, "What's going on?" So he basically was gonna put me in the game. Like he dressed me in, like the kids hanging off of me, and he before the game he sat me down. He said, "Okay, don't worry about nothing. You know, you're gonna be fine. You know, I know you're nervous." And I'm like, almost about to cry. Like I'm so <laughs> nervous. And he's like, "Don't worry, you're gonna be fine. You know, I've got faith in you. I trust in you." And he he put me in the game, and I was. Breaking their white heat press and their jaw white trapping and and I was just like after that game I was just like for me that's kind of when it started to click like I was like you know what like, I can actually do something with this you know what I'm saying I can actually take this somewhere you know and the fact that he had that faith in me you know I was 12 years old playing under 18s with giants you know um, the fact that he had that that faith in me it was like wow like this guy he believes in me you know and then I think that's when he kind of I wouldn't, I'm, yeah, I'd, I'd say give me like special treatment, you know, like he, he, he wouldn't shout at me all the time, you know, like we kind of had that, okay, I know what he wants now, you know, because before, you know, anyone knows Jimmy, Jimmy's on you, 
like there's, Tough no, love, there's right. no chance to breathe. You know what I'm saying? Like he, he holds everyone to a, a certain um, standard. But it was it was that that twelve thirteen area where thirteen age where he kind of okay this this kid can be something you know and he he, he kind of like nurtured it you know instead of just at me you know so yeah. Would you would you I was gonna ask like at what moment did you realize that oh, you know this is a thing that you really want to go after and pursue? Would you say that that was that was the point? Um, that was the point where I realized that I could do it. Okay. But um, I mean for me it started with ta- it started straight away. I mean. Like when I first started playing, or like a year or two in, you know, we used to have all the older guys come back from the states, you know, like rough and ready, all these things. And I'm seeing these guys. I'm like, ah, oh, man, I want to do this. You guys coming back with their white tees and Tims, and I'm like, oh, America seems cool, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, straight away, you know, straight away, there was something that I wanted to do, but it went until around that time where I started believing in myself, you know, that I could do this, you know. So yeah. Your junior basketball career in England before before you left. Um, there's one game that everyone talks about, which is the seventy. Was it seventy or was it seventy two points? Seventy one. Seventy one. Was it seventy one? Okay. Um, there was. I don't know if you saw. There was a, a London Lions under eighteen yeah, seventy one yeah, yeah. like a couple of weeks ago, and I had a, I had a couple of messages that were like, uh, it wasn't like Justin. Justin's was against legit competition. Um, but yeah, what, what, yeah, like I've kind of. Heard, I think I remember because I'm, I'm a year older than you, um, and I think I'm sure I remember growing up and and it kind of get. I, I grew up in Eastbourne on the southeast yeah. coast, and I, I'm sure it uh, sort of got down and someone said, "Oh, this kick, kick with Justin Robinson or whatever." Um, what are your memories of the get with that game? What what competition was it in, uh, and who was it against? And kind of like, yeah, what, what, what do you, tell us about it? Um, I don't remember what league it was. I think I'm not even sure what league it was. Um, was it 18s or under 18s? It was under 18s. Under 18s. Under 18s. Yeah, and we was playing Thames Valley. Okay. But back then it was like Capitals, White Heat, um, East London Royals. Who else was there? What team? Um, what's that team in uh, Kent, man? It was not Colchester. Was that a team? Colchester's Essex. Is that Essex? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But like, yeah, um, Matt Gaiman's team. Okay, yeah. yeah but, but by then, he had left already. Um, but I, I just remember, to be honest, like, I just remember making everything yeah, <laughs> in the game. And, and back then, I, I couldn't really shoot like that. You know, um, it was just all like athleticism, get to the basket, finishing. You know, that, that was pre-surgery, pre-injuries, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, when I got to a certain age, I think, there wasn't no pressure from Jimmy no more. Like he, there was no shouting. He just gave me the keys to basically do what you want. You know. Um, I mean, which might not have been fair to other players, but um, yeah. I mean, I had like free reign to do anything really. And I mean, yeah, seventy one. Uh, I just happened to score seventy one that that um, that time. And and I think what it was is because I, I remember early in the summer I, I went to go and get my visa my um, student visa and I got denied so I was home for like extra two three months and it was just anger it was just um, fear of, of not going so it was just like an, an extra incentive to just kind of just go all the way in and I mean it was games it was like 60s and 50s like I, I forget my average 50 you know? really yeah and I, was, I think I was playing men's yeah I, was, I think it was like division 2 or something like that I think I might be averaging like 30 or something like that it was, it was just like like I said, it, it was Jimmy that kind of gave me that that fuel, you know. Put, he put that fuel to the fire, just like go go and and do, do do your thing, you know. So, yeah. Who who were uh, at that time the other juniors that were kind of coming up? That when when people were talking about who the top sort of young guys coming through, obviously you were one of them. I just assume Matt Matt was one of them. Um, you know, who who were the other names that that and sort of your competition that you saw as the other guys uh, that were at your kind of level? Growing up was um, Paul Grade. Paul Gray was a, like, if people saw Paul at 15, and like, he was a man-child already. Um, Holy White Heat, I mean, Darius Defoe, he was a bit older, but Laddie Brown, all, all those guys were in my competition. Um, East London Rose, um, Fuller, Albert, and you know, all these guys, Joe, um, Randy, who was, then you had like, um, Matt Guyman yeah. and Solent. Joe Freeland was under 18s. Um, who else? There's, there's so many names I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, 
but I feel like there's a lot of talent around around yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, sort yeah, of age yeah. group. 87s, 88s. Yeah. Seven, eight, eight. yeah I mean, um, there's a lot of names. Yeah, Dan Clark, but well, he left. He left to go to Spain. He was he was with um with where I think. Yeah. Where Rebels. Yeah. Um. I mean, there, there's a lot of players, man. Yeah, there was a lot of players back then. But, if, you, um, if you were to compare, I mean, I don't know if you get to go to watch a lot of junior basketball uh, now, um, but if you if you were to compare kind of some of the under 18s that you see now compared to uh, the generation, well, your generation coming through, um, you know, what would you say are the differences, if if any? You know what? It, it, it would be unfair for me to, to like critique them because I haven't seen enough. Um, but I think there's more talent now. I, I think it's more widespread. Obviously, there's more clubs and. Um, there's more opportunities for, for kids to, to train and, you know, there's better facilities. So I would say that there's more talent. Um, not necessarily saying that they're better players, you know, because I think the year, the, what year? I, I think like the, the generation before me were much better, you know, the, the Sean Grays and the, um, that whole Brixton, White Elan era, you know, Pierre and Fontaine, all those guys. Um, I, I, for me, I, I think that was the golden era. Jermaine Forbes and all them guys, Andrew Sullivan, Andrew Deng. To me, I, I think that was the golden era of, of basketball in terms of like junior basketball. So it would be fair to me. It would, yeah, yeah. It would be unfair for me to say, oh, you know, these, these kids, this, these kids, that. And I haven't watched them. I haven't done my my, my research on on who's who. So. So when you were 12, 13 years old, um, in terms of your aspirations, like were you looking at the likes of you know Andrew, Pierre, whoever? Um, or were you looking to the states? Like, who were your role models, and 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 sort of where were you looking to get to when you were when you were coming up? Um, for me, I mean, my role models were this, the older Brooks and guys. You know, like I said, Sean, Lakin, Marvin, Marcus, Rashid Quadri, You know, Daniel Sandel, Marcus. Yeah, man, I say Marcus already. Marcus Knight, um, Luau, Adju. The, the list goes on, man. You know what I'm saying, um, f- for me, the those guys were like, those, those guys pushed me, man. Like, they didn't have no mercy on me, man. Like, <laughs> even I'm, I'm like 11 years old, scrimmaging with grown men, and they're posting me up, pushing me, you know, slapping me, shouting at me if I turn it over. So, um, for me, it, it was those guys, you know. That for me, that was that was like the family, you know. Um, and I mean, like I said. At that age, 12, 13, it was just getting to America. That was just the main thing, you know. I mean, at, at that stage, Brixton, was, everyone was flying out each year, you know, someone was going to the States. So you're seeing it constantly. So someone come back, they're telling you stories about this and that. So it's constantly getting reinforced in your mind, okay, this is the place to be, you know. Um, so, yeah, man, that was the, the end goal, you know, to get to America. Were you um, representing England juniors at this point? Um, like, did you, did you represent at all before you left? No, 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 no. no. Okay. Um, I think I played the first time I played for England was might have been seventeen. I think under eighteen. Yeah, under eighteen team. No, yeah, under eighteen team. Okay. Um. Certainly, uh, the move to the states. How how did that come about? Um. Yeah, like was it that conversation? Yeah. <laughs> that was the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um. So the coach from UConn was the one that sorted you out of place. Yeah, yeah. Um. I said Jimmy just just dragged me along. Was like, yo, here's him. Here's his sort mom. him out. What's going on? Like he, he just put he, he put pressure on him, you know, um, and he he wanted to put me and Matthew in the same school, but they didn't have enough spaces, and then he, he put me in some um, it was like a I don't know what to even call it. It was, it was some school in Virginia, you know, which was a, a hellhole, you know. I've yeah, heard a little bit about yeah. this. Tell us about because well, yeah. the thing is when people talk, talk about your high school career, everyone always speaks about Blair Academy, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But there was a couple of st- stops before that, awesome. so. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about kind of what happened uh, um, in Virginia. <laughs> so to keep it short, um, so like I was told, you know, I'll get there, you know, have my own room. So in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, when you, when you think America, you, I'm thinking like white picket fences, you know, big house, kids playing in the street, ice cream, ice cream van, all this stuff. So like, as soon as I landed, I, I, um, I met the coach, and I just, you know, you just meet someone, you just know. It's off, like, <laughs> the whole vibe was, I, I just knew something was wrong. Um, so I, I met him, we're driving to practice. I think it was, like, landing in D.C. It was, like, a two-hour drive to Virginia. And we didn't say one word to each other. Like, not one word. The whole time I'm thinking about how I'm going to jump out on the highway and escape or 
you don't have to punch him in or something, you know. I'm just trying to think of a escape route, you know. Um, so yeah, uh, we get to the school and we practice, and then this, this is when I knew it was bad. This is when I knew I, I was in for it. Um, we, when the Americans like, yo man, like, where were you staying? I was, I was staying with the coach, and he was like, oh man, like he 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 he, he said a, a offensive word. He basically said, oh. Yeah. Um, so I was like, yo, like, what do you mean? He's like, you'll see. So I was like, oh, man. So we're driving, driving, driving. I see us, like, after, after like an hour, I see a sign saying, um, thank you for visiting Virginia. So we're leaving the state. So we, we left Virginia and went into West Virginia and we're driving, driving, driving. And the scenery just starts changing. Like, you know, it's getting, it's getting from nice to worse to worse. And we pull into like a trailer park. Um, yeah, and we was basically staying in the trailer park. And there was another guy, Callum Jones, based in Manchester. He was there, and there was two Hungarian kids. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, um, yeah, I mean, I ain't going to go into too much detail, but, you know, those that are close to me, they, they, they know the story, you know. Um, it was just, it was horrible, man. And I ended up leaving there. Um, when we left there. I got there around like, October, and, and I left... Um, at December time, Christmas time, I was like, oh, I'm going home for Christmas, you know, I'll see, see you. You just was a bounce out. And, and then never came back. And then um, I ended up going to South Kent, to Matthew School. His his coach see me, um, or I, I guess Matt spoke to him, or yeah, and I went to South Kent to finish up the year. And then the next two years, I went to Blair. And I was okay. Blair and Blair was like, oh, are you still interested in going to Blair? Um, I was like, yeah, of course, like, it's Blair, you know. Um, so then, yeah, I finished up the two years at Blair. So was Matthew at South Kent when you were there? Yeah, you yeah, were there yeah, together? Yeah. Oh, wow. So that yeah. must have been like yeah. pretty amazing for you guys well, to... definitely helpful, you know. Um, obviously, we grew up together, you know, from Brixton program. Um, so to have a familiar face there was it was cool, you know. So, yeah. So aside from, um, you know, the living conditions, uh, the basketball, um, you know, the transition from, from the UK to the States... What were your memory? Well, what are your memories of, of you know the differences in the basketball? Kind of what your first impressions were? How you settled in? Like was it a case of you know well you're in England maybe averaging fifty and under 18s and yeah. you're going out to high school? Like what, what, what? How was it? You know what? Um, I think the biggest thing for me was everyone there athletic. Like in England, like when I was young, it used, it used to blow by everyone. You know, get the basket, no shot blocker. It was just it was just easy, you know. And then I think in, in England, especially like when you're young. When you have a, a rep, kids kind of like, they fear you, you know, it's like, oh, it's so-and-so, or they're scared to press you, or scared to guard you tight. Whereas in America, they do not care. Like, you could be McDonald's with American, NBA All-Star, they're going to full court press you, trap you. So I just think Americans have a different mentality to sports, you know. It, it's not, I think in England it's about, you know, like, I remember being in primary school and then sports day, they'll say, oh, it's not about winning, it's about taking part. <laughs> Americans, they'll have their under five baseball league, Parents will be there, you know, they take it. It's a serious thing, you know. So um, it, it's a whole different mentality. And then when you get there, it's kind of like, whoa, like, relax, man. Like, <laughs> you know what um, but then you obviously, it's either you you swim or you sink, you know. So you just have to adapt, you know. You, you, you kind of have to be, adopt their mentality and um, just give it right back, you know. So it probably took me, like, the, the first year was tough, you know. I struggled and I think, like, my... Next two years, I started coming into myself and, you know, um, just competing and playing at a high level, you know. You know, at Blair, um, what was that like, uh, kind of reflect on, on those two years that you had there? Blair was, was amazing, man. Um, my coach, uh, Joe Mantegna, he was, he was the Wilds coach as well. Um, so I think as soon as I came there, it was like an instant connection, you know, um, you know, he, he knew Jimmy, you know, him and Jimmy had, had a relationship and he was he was excited to have me there, you know. Um and straight away he, he treated me like his son, man, you know. Um like even to this day we got a great great relationship, you know, we we, we always talk, um, I'm close with his family, with his kids, you know, and he made my time there special, man. And it was just the whole Blair community, you know, um, has some great teammates that I still speak to, you know, they're still some of my closest friends, you know. Every time I go back there, the teachers still show me love, you know. It's, it's just a, a great place, man, a great place to go to school. Um, it's almost like you're in, like, a, a utopia, like a bubble, you know. Um, and it's, 
it's sad because when you leave that bubble and you go to college, you go to university, you start, it's like, damn, you know, like, I had something great back then, you know, and then you go to college and everyone's kind of in it for their own own gain, you know, and becomes a business. But but Blair was it was great, man, you know. Um, two years in a row, we lost in the state, state championship finals, unfortunately. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, I had a good career there, you know, so I'm, 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 I'm happy with my time there. At what point um, did the colleges come knocking? You know, talk to us about the recruitment process. I, it always fascinates me because we see it in the movies. You know, he got game and it's just all this craziness. Um, you know, when did the colleges come, kind of who was coming? Uh, yeah, and h- how were you dealing with it? Um, I think they started, to be honest, you, you start getting letters right away, but everyone gets letters, you know. At first when you see you're like, oh, rah, it's also, but then it's some letter that's, typed out, sent to thousands of recruits. Just replaces your yeah, name. You know yeah, yeah. Um, but then, where was it? I think it was my junior year. That's when that school started, like, writing handwritten letters and uh, trying to think of some of the schools. Um, a lot of, like, A10 schools, like UMass, St. Louis. Um, I know Duke came down, you know, I think my coach was like, oh, you know, check this guy out. Um, who else? Like, Duke, yeah, a lot of, like, Duquesne, yeah, like a lot of like mid-major schools. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the bigger schools. When you started getting the, the offers, do you remember thinking, that, like, I'm, I'm good. I've got a scholarship." Like, you who know, was the first one to um, offer? Like, what? what was my first offer? I don't actually remember, you know, but I, I do remember it was at um, Eastern Invitational. I'm not sure if you heard of that. Nah. it's a camp in New Jersey, um, old school camp. I'm not sure if it still goes on, but um, Eastern's like a it's a jungle, man. Like. Hey, like guys! Guys are coming up to you, taking the ball. From you. Your teammates coming, taking the ball from you. Like, yo, I need to get mine. You know I'm saying, so it's, it's one of them places where it's hard to shine. Yeah, and it's hard to do it without seeming very selfish. Yeah, you know? but I think I think it was um, I think it might have been Ryder. You know that that offered me first. Oh, really? Was it right? I don't think it was Ryder. It, it was one. It was like a, a school, like a smaller school in New Jersey or East Coast. Um, it might have been like St. Peter's or one of them schools but um, you know what my memory is so bad you know <laughs> I can't even think but I had a lot of offers um, yeah a few big schools but you know they were saying yeah, you have to come there and you have to redshirt or, or yeah. you, you won't play until your sophomore year so I just thought to myself it's better to be a, a big fish in a small pond you know and um, I took like I took three visits I took, went to UMass St. Louis and Ryder and St. Louis was saying, oh, you know, we got a senior point guard, you know, you might not play much your freshman year. So I was like, uh. And then on the visit, it was good, but like I said, me, I, I, I'm more about the vibe I get from people. And if it ain't right, then it's not right, you know? Yeah. Um. So, and then you might as well kind of saying the same thing. And then with Ryder, they, they were saying, you know, you come in, start four years right away, you know, we give you the keys to the team, um, you know, we guarantee you have a great career here, blah, blah, blah. And then also, I was staying in state, you know. I, I'm, I, I didn't want to leave New Jersey or leave, leave too far from my coach where he couldn't come and see me play a game or that bond, would, you know, would have been weakened, you know. So um, I, I just chose chose Ryder and then they kept their promise, you know. Freshman year came and started and started. You pretty much started every game, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, 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 your whole career. There might have been like two games, like, yeah. I think I was coming off injury or or like seeing the night, you know, stuff like that. But um, yeah, they, they kept their promise and, you know, it worked out. When you look back on, on your college career, um, you know, at that time we were doing a Brits in college recap every single week and, you know, you were pretty much one of the top performers every single week. Um, you know, how do you, how do you look back on, on that on that period and how do you reflect on, on your time at, at Ryder? Um, yeah, I mean, Ryder was, was cool, man. I mean, I wish that I was coached a bit harder, you know, um, in terms of what being pushed, yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say like I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say like to play harder. I, I just mean like being held accountable more. You know, um, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. It's, it's hard to kind of put it into words, but like my um, prep school coach came to one game and he and he was like, well, "What the hell are you doing?" And I was like, "What do you mean?" And he was like nitpicking on all the things that I was doing wrong. And then, but no one was telling me that I was doing it wrong, you know. So it's the stuff that I wasn't used to getting away with that I was used used to that I was getting away with, you know. Yeah. The, 
um, they were letting me get away with it. Um, but I mean, in, individually, I feel like I had a good career. You know, I think I had like 1,400, 1,500 points. I think I was like top 10 points, top three in assists that like, all time, you know, um, three point percentage, all that stuff. Um, like all, all first team Mac, my senior year, all Metro team. Um, so I had a good career, um, but at, at the same time, you know, we didn't win nothing. You know, my my freshman year, we finished first in the MAC, and then we lost in the conference tournament finals. Um, and then my sophomore year, we lost in the semis, and junior was finals, and so you know, always kind of coming up short, and it's just that regret of not ever going to the NCAA tournament. You know, um, but I feel like individually, I, I had a good career. Um, Especially my my last two years, I kind of picked it up and you know kind of came into my own. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed my time. You know, like I said, I made some lifelong friends, um, and I mean it's a place that I could always go back to and go, go to visit, go to work out. You know, um, so yeah, I mean I always try to leave behind good relationships. You know, with, with people. So, how did you find balancing um, your studies with? With uh, with basketball, I know there's there's some people that say to me that uh, when they get to the states, they're surprised that actually the college education is a lot easier than than in the UK. Um, but yeah, what what were your memories of it? Um, to be honest, coming from Blair, college was a cakewalk, man. Yeah, because yeah. like Blair was a very academic school, um, and I mean I got all A's and B's in my GCSEs, so I'm not a stupid <laughs> kid, you know. Yeah. Um, but like going to America. The schoolwork is like it's just ridiculous, man. Like it's so easy. Yeah. Um. You know they got like multiple choice stuff, and you know it's, it's just like it's if you can't pass that, you're just lazy, man. Yeah. You just you're just lazy, and you you just don't want to do the work. Um. But in college, it, it was fine. I mean, it, it's just about organizing your time. You know. Um. Me, I'm I'm more, I'm, I'm like a last minute guy. You know. Um. I've been in the library like online trying trying to do a paper or up to like three four in the morning, but. I got it done, you know, um, I finished with like a, a B average, you know, and that wasn't even trying, like, I wasn't <laughs> even like focused on school, I was just doing enough to get by, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was easy, man, easy, easy. Easy. Man. Yeah. At what point, um, well, were you, were you always confident that you were going to end up having a professional career or was there a point at college where you're like, okay, this is now reality, like I feel like I'm, I'm pretty much there now, it's going to happen, um, or was there never any doubt? Um, I think there's always doubt, you know. I think at each level of your career, there's, there's doubt. Like, for example, when, when I was here, there was doubt about going to America. When I was in America, there was doubt about getting a D1 scholarship. You got a D1 scholarship, and then there's doubt about if you if you can play pro. So I think if you don't have any doubt, you, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. You know, you, you, you kind of always have to have that that um, sense of uncertainty, you know, to kind of keep you on your toes, you know. Um, but... It was probably my junior year, to be honest. I mean, I always wanted to play professionally, but it was probably my junior year where I started like, putting up big numbers and stuff, and I was like, okay, like, I can do this. And then my senior year, um, I was supposed to go to a uh, Portsmouth invitation. And then somehow, you know, my coach was still telling me, oh, yeah, I'm speaking to the guys there, and blah, 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 they like you. And the list came out. It was, I think it was like top 64 seniors. Yeah. The list came out, and my name was on it, you know. And there's, there's guys there that are from... Mid major conferences averaging like seven points, eight points, and then Matt's, Matt's there. He's calling me. He's like, "Yo, man, if you was here, you know, like these guys here that aren't even good, you know." So um, for me, it was it, it, it was a bit of a like bittersweet, you know, like raw, like how come I'm not there, you know? I know I'm good enough, you know. Average fifteen and a half and, and four assists my senior year. Team finished in second place, you know, all these. So, but I mean, you can't really control those things, you know. Um, but I mean, my, my senior year, I, I, I knew it was pretty much a, a done deal, you know, especially after I signed it with an agent and he was saying, you know, this team, that team is contacting him about you. Um, so yeah, I mean, but yeah, it, for me, it's always good to have a little bit of uncertainty to kind of keep you on your toes yeah. in case things do do go bad, you know, you, you know, you're prepared for it instead of just saying, oh, I'm going to be there, I'm going to make it. You know? There's no level of satisfaction if there's no difficulty, exactly. right? It's exactly. like you've exactly. got to be, all the growth comes from being on the, exactly. on the edge of your comfort zone. Um, exactly. So when you when uh, the pro stuff started coming around, like the process of signing with an agent, you know, how did you decide to sign with? Um, why did you sign with the agent that you signed with? Um, and kind of, you know, what professional uh, teams were, were looking at you and how did you make a decision on, on where to go? Um, I signed with a guy, Mario Scotty. 
Okay, I know Maria. Yeah, it was. Um, I'm not sure if you, if you remember the agency Two Points. Yeah. Um, and they had I a was, bunch of GB guys at once. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was um, how old was I? I was young. I, I was like the only young guy on GB apart from Dan Clark. And I forget what year it was. It might have been like 2009. I was in Turkey, and Finn had like I think he think he had the time. Nick George, Kieran Achara, Flynn the Boyd. And someone else, and they were just like, yo, man, you know, Mario keeps talking about you, you know, he wants to represent you, blah, 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 blah. So I was like, okay, cool, you know. And then I kind of I kind of kept the relationship strong, you know, for my last two years. And um, there was a bunch of agents, you know, contacting me, you know, signed with me, you know, Luar's agent asked me to sign with him. But um, the vibe I got from, from Mario Squirt, it was, you know, that like he actually cared, you know. Um, he, he, he flew out to the States and, you know, he came up, you know, we had, had a meal and he spoke to me and he just kept it real, you know, he, he, he told me what the deal was and I just felt comfortable, you know, it's like, okay, I, I have all the, the about 20 plus agents that are messaging me, he's the only guy that I know that someone else can vouch for, you know, so that, that's all I had yeah. to base my decision off, you know, so I just went with him and then um, he, he got me a, a good offer, it was in Greece, um, it was a yeah. short-lived one in Greece, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, you know how that goes, you know, in Greece, it was, um, I mean, I was excited, and I was like, oh, you know, A1 Greece, top level, Olympiacos, all these teams, Panathinaikos, and then when I got there, there was an old American there, and he was just like, as soon as he landed, he was just seeing all the red flags, but obviously I'm not seeing it because it's my first year, yeah. I'm just excited to be there, right? <laughs> Yeah. and then come, come to find out there's no money. There's no money. So, I, mean, I think my contract was like 20 days, they don't pay you, you can sit out, another 10 days, you can leave. So, um, other teams were hitting me up, and there was a team in Cyprus, and I just bounced. I was just like, I'm so, out. did you not get a single paycheck from them? No, I think I got like, maybe like half half my paycheck. Yeah, oh, wow. it was something stupid like that. Um, and they kept kept just dragging it along, like, oh, tomorrow, tomorrow, no, the money's coming, you know, TV rights and all this just, just, just trying to, just trying to like keep you there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you got a rude introduction yeah, to sort of pro life then in me. Europe. And then the um, the American left, and then shortly after I left, and then yeah, I just went to Cyprus, and it was it was, it was sweet there, you know. First day, you get an apartment, phone, car, money, you know. Yeah, it was cool, man. You know, the there's a, everyone seems to have stories about uh, you know pro life in Europe. Um, you know, you play in a lot of places now. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the countries. It was Greek, Greece, Cyprus, Hungary, Ukraine. Ukraine. You did a short stint in Slovenia as well. Yeah, yeah Sweden, yeah, yeah. Uh, France. I'll tell you that that story. Slovenia. One. Tell, tell us about Slovenia because that was with um, a Euro Cup team. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was with Olympija. Yeah, Olympija. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it. So they send the contract. Yeah, and everything was you know, was good and the money was good, all the terms were good, but there was something that kind of caught me off guard. So it said, it said team will help player find a two bedroom apartment. So I told my agent, I'm like, yo, what do you mean help? It, it should say provide. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so he messaged the people at, at Olympia. I was like, yo, what's this? They're like, oh, don't worry. You know, this, this is, this is down to um, Slovenian taxes and blah, blah, blah. So we're like, all right, cool. So we get there. Um, <clears throat> they put us in a hotel, five star hotel. I found out that the team had a, a, a sponsored deal, okay. so they weren't paying for it. Okay. Um, so we're in the hotel, and then I find out that they're not providing our food in the hotel. So I'm like, okay, I'm like, you have to, you have to provide us food until you, you give us our apartments. You know, this, this is standard <laughs> yeah. procedure. So that threw me off, and I had like a younger um, Serbian guy staying in the hotel with me, a different room but same hotel, and then. He went to go and see his apartment, and his apartment was like the worst thing I've ever seen. The worst, like worse than the trailer park. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like kitchen, the cupboard, kitchen door hanging off, and like mismatched flooring, and it was it was just a mess. So he he came back. He's like, oh, I'm not taking it. I'm not taking it. The next day, they took him to see a place, but not. But they didn't tell me because they knew that I would influence him. I said, yo, don't take that. So he came out to the hotel, he's like, yo, man, they're making me take this hotel, they're making me take this apartment. So I was like, okay, cool. So each day I'm in the, I'm in the locker room speaking with the Slovenian guys, and they're like, yo, I haven't been paid since last year. 
and blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, you know, there's, there's something not right about this. So one of my former teammates from Greece, he played there when they were EuroLeague. So he hit me up, he's like, yo, I heard you just signed with Olympia. I was like, yeah, yeah. He's like, man, they still owe me like 20K. So I'm like, what? Like, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, what's this? So then it's like all these little red flags. Yeah. So I'm like, oh man, I hope I ain't got myself in, in this situation again. So then it's time for it's time for my apartment now. So they're like, you know what? In, instead of driving around and showing you apartments, we're gonna send you some some links on WhatsApp. So they sent me the um the links for the apartment. And I'm like, oh man, this is nice, you know. Blah, blah. They're like, yeah, you know, your son can run around and it's big, you know, big and spacious for you. So I'm like, all right, cool. So he's like, oh, and plus it's only a thousand euros a month. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, cool, cool, cool. So I'm like, oh, but the team take care of that, right? He's like, no, no, you take care of it. I'm like, what? So then obviously they've got me now with the contract. Yeah. Remember, it's the wording. Me, I'm, I don't take chances with any wording, but they got me nicely. So um, he's like, no, 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 the contract says this. And it's a miscommunication. Your agent didn't tell you, blah, blah. So, so now there's a big, like, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm vexed now. I'm like, yo, like, you, you guys are, are trying it, basically. So I told my agent, I'm like, yo, like, I need to get out of this. But I'm hitting on my agent, but he's not responding. He's driving across Europe. So he's, he said he ain't got no, no Wi-Fi. That's what he said. Um, so the, um, the GM, I'm like, yo, you know, I'm not comfortable with this. You know, let's, I go my way, you go your way. He's like, oh, no, the coach loves you. You know, he wants to keep you, blah, 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 blah. You know, I, I mean, just give me 24 hours. Just sleep on it. I'll fix it, blah, 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 blah. So I wake up. It's, just, it's the same problem. I'm like, yo, you know what? I've got a family. I don't like being violated. Like, I go my way, you go your way. He's like, okay, um, I write up a, a, a release form, blah, 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 don't worry, we let you go. I get the release form now, they're saying they want three grand. <laughs> I've been there 10 days, they're saying they want three grand. Like, they're saying they want they want money for plasters, for for um, bandages, oh, for wow. coaching instructions, all this stuff. So that, that affected me going to Greece. So then I left, went to Greece. Day, a day before the... Um, so did you have to pack? Did you pack? No, no. no, so no okay. A day before the, um, you know, like each team, you have to go and get your, um, what's it called? Like a player card, like a, a license. Yeah. So like everyone's in the office, the GM, the coaches, it's me and Americans. We go there to sign the forms or whatever. So, so the coaches, they run out panicking. Justin, you're not released from Union Olympia. I'm like, what? Because they told my, Union Olympia told my agent that it's sorted, that, you know, that they'll release me. So my agent had to call him up like, yo, I'll send, if he sent like 500 euros and they released me. But he told him that he would send the rest and they were like harassing him, like calling him like, yo, we need the money. You know? So yeah, it was just like a, a dodgy, yeah. dodgy situation, man. So, I mean, I paid my own flight to get home. I'm like, yo, I'm out, man. Like, yeah. just, just let me go, man. So that's one of, one one of the more interesting yeah, stories. Yeah, yeah, man. Like these things will get you. Like, if you don't, and, and I saw it as well. I'm like, ah, oh, like, yo, what do you mean provide? It should say, no, it said help find, sorry. It said help find two-bedroom apartment. It should say, team will provide you with accommodation, two-bedroom apartment, fully furnished, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Free of charge. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, do, you, do you find that you have to, uh, you know, really go through contracts with a fine because yeah. people will just try and do just, Yeah, listen, man, you have to, well, read it even 10 times, you know, read it over and over again. If it's something you ain't sure, take it to a solicitor, take it to a lawyer, take it to someone that works in business, you know. Like you can't take no chances, man, because these teams will try to try to get over on you, man. It's always a way with these things as well that they almost um, they kill you with just so much legal mumbo jumbo that it's actually quite hard to understand. Yeah, so you have to read each point yeah. about five times yeah. to put it in English to be exactly. like, oh, that's what that means. They'll, they'll really try to confuse you, man. But no, you know, would you say uh, like as a, as a professional basketball player, when you look back on on your pro career from where you started in your rookie year to, to now? Um, Aside from the contractual side of things, what are, you know, maybe some of the biggest things that you've learned that if you were speaking to, you know, a guy coming out of college now, that you were trying to give him a bit of advice, um, what you would say? Oh, <laughs> uh, boy. I would say just chase the money. Yeah. Chase the money, man. Trust me. Because, like, how many times an, an agent has tricked me and, like, uh, you know what, don't worry about the money. You know, if you play in this league, you know, help your resume. No. Nah. Go where they offer you the most money. Really? Because it's a short window. The ball don't bounce forever. Get your money. Stack your money. 
and that's it. You know, like it could be it could be anywhere. It could be Qatar, China. Go where the money is because, like I said, it's, it's a short a short window, man. You know, all these agents say, "Are oh, you playing this league?" And blah blah. Who cares where you played? It's about what you got to show for when you're done. You know, you know what house do you have? What what, what investments do you have? What 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 um high interest accounts or you know no, no one cares that you played in Turkey or Greece and you're getting a grand a month like come on play where you can get that, get that money man simple as that yeah there's there's obviously a thing where when people are considering um, offers in the Middle East or wherever they're always like well the moment you do that that's you're boxed into that and that's what you're going to have to play for the rest of the thing but you're saying if you're getting the money still who cares like if they're offering you 20 grand Stay there. Yeah. Play, play there six, seven years. Come BBO, wherever. You're, you're nice, you know. Like, people get so caught up. And the thing is that the agents will do it to scare people. Oh, don't play here because, you know, um, other leagues won't respect your resume or you get trapped there. So what? Yeah. The money's good. Stay there. You know what I'm saying? What are you worried about going anywhere else for if they're taking care of you, if they're providing everything you need for you and your family? Stay there, man. Yeah, for sure. I, I always uh, I always point to Ryan Richards as, you know, someone, people Perfect. people criticise him, you Perfect know, and say, example. oh, he hasn't played, reached his potential with Dunham. And it's like, well, actually, he's earned more money than most people have from playing basketball. Exactly. You know, like, I, I know Ryan. Like, he spoke to me about his time in Iran. And he loved it. Yeah. I mean, while you, if it ain't broke, it ain't, don't fix it. You know? like, while you leave, who cares that he ain't played EuroLeague or, or Greece or Spain? Like you said, he's earned more money than... Uh, aside from probably Luau and Pops, you know? yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you know, you, you talk there about you have a short window. You know, you're you just recently turned thirty one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, have you got one eye on kind of the end and 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 sort of? I, I would guess that you've probably got at least a good five six years left if you, if you wanted it. Good, good. Um, <laughs> kind of, what are you thinking in terms of the next step? I, I feel like, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like. Uh, you know, up until the last couple of years, you've always been very low-key, not on social, and yeah. recently your social profile's been growing a little bit, and I wonder whether that's because you're thinking about the next stage and kind of yeah. having some sort of profile to be able to, you know, whether it's coaching, talking, yeah. you know, doing events, whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, kind of, ha- what are you thinking about the sort of the next step? Um, I mean, like you said, I mean, God willing, injury-free, if I can play, I don't know, maybe between four and six more years, uh, I'll be satisfied with that. Um but yeah, I mean, for me, I just want to do like um, mentorship, basically, you know, if, if you want to call it that. Um, if it involves basketball, you know, so be it. Um, or just helping kids, you know, just, just helping kids in gangs, kids that are coming from tough home situations across the board, you know, kids dealing with bipolar, homelessness, depression, whatever it may be, you know, I, I just want to be in that field of helping people, you know, and I think that's my calling, just to help kids, you know, kids that come from a similar background, you know, that I come from, because, um, man, these kids out here are moving crazy, man, you know what I'm saying, so, you know, there needs to be a, a, a lot more positive role models, you know, that, um, that have come from the same place yeah, they've come yeah, from as well, know, I think that's it, so important, you know, that can relate to them and, and speak to them a certain way, you know, um, I'm not speaking down to them, I'm speaking with them, you know, speaking at them, so, I mean, for me, you know, there's, a, there's something that I'm putting in place to, to try and um, get involved in that field. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully by the time I'm done, I can just nicely slide into that position or transition into it. Um, so, yeah. Are you getting to do anything sort of in that type of field now on the side while you're still playing? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there's a, a few things that I did with um, a guy called Dexter Sims. Um, he's on Instagram. Um, we did a a youth tournament down at the Regal, and um, also Jason Henley down at the Regal. Yeah. Um, me and him have spoken about doing some stuff in the future, um, some like life skills, mentorship, you know, for kids in the Kennet and Brixton area. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's a few things that you know we're, we're trying to do, but obviously it's early early days now. But hopefully, like I said, by the time I'm done. Um, I'll be, you know, certified in that, in that field. <laughs> One of the things that we we haven't touched upon too much, but that I would love to talk about, um, is GB mm-hmm. and uh, sort of your your international career. Um, you know, you were uh, when the when the British basketball program sort of first come around. Uh, you were like you said earlier, one of the younger guys uh, with Dan that was involved with the program. Um, can you talk about those? 
those years. I think was it two thousand nine was your first year. I feel like it was, it was around then. Um, I think so. Yeah, yeah, it was around that yeah, time. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, what were your interactions with the GB program um, and your memories of it uh, back then? Yeah. Um, and yeah, how how you look back on sort of that period in particular in the run up to two thousand twelve. Um, GB, how can I put it? Like I said, I mean, there's nothing to hide, you know, I, I keep it real, but GB, it wasn't really always a positive for me, you know, like, it was just, it was good, you know, because you're around your guys, and at the times, there was a lot of Brixton guys, there was about six of us there, you know, so we kind of click, click together, you know, which is a, a, a natural thing, you know, you, you, you sit, you eat with people that you know, you know. Um, but it, it was a weird one, you know, because, like, I don't know. It's, it's hard to even describe it, you know, because, like, Chris Finch, he, he wasn't the most people person, you know. Um, you know, they, him, who was the other guy that was there? As, uh, as what, assistant? Yeah, I don't think. Nick Nurse? Nick Nurse was cool, he was cool. But just, like, the whole... Oh, was it Mokeski? He was cool as well. Okay. There's another guy, um, Ron Motula. He, yeah, he yeah, Ron Motula, like the, the North American yeah, manager like, or whatever, the relationship guy for the guys yeah, in the States. It, it was just, um, they kind of gave off the the sense that they were above everyone, you know, and especially like us guys that were in college, you know, we were treated differently, you know, like he was shouting at us, screaming at us, and then older guys, you know, he would be scared to shout at them, you know. As a coach, it's hard to respect you when you don't, hold everyone accountable, you know. For the same mistakes. What's his name? Greg Popovich. He's going to coach Tim Duncan to the 12th man the same way, you know. So it's hard to gain people's respect when you don't hold everyone accountable and you're only picking and choosing when you're shouting at people, you know. So it was tough, you know. You know, um, GB wasn't... It, it, like, I mean, for, 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 when I was young in GB, you didn't really feel wanted, you know, or needed. You just there, oh, you know, another young guy, let's bring him on, you know. Um, did you feel like that, did you feel like you were being brought in on some level for them to be able to tick that box saying yeah, we've got a young British guy yeah, on the team yeah, type yeah, thing yeah 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 almost you know and then um, yeah it was weird it was weird but it was just good to be there you know you're around your guys you know, you're playing at high level but like the people were involved I didn't really mess with them like that I'll yeah. be honest you know um, I, I, I don't think they messed with me which, which is fine you know <laughs> it's, 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 it was a mutual feeling so um, and that was clear from the Olympic you know, the Olympic thing, whereas I was involved every year and then, bam, you, you know, you just choose not to invite me, which is fine, you know, but let me know, you know, I shouldn't have to be... I'm trying to think, so, because uh, there was one, so there was Eurobasket 2009, mm -hmm. right? You didn't go, did you go to that? No. No, no, no you no, didn't no. go to that, but you were involved in the training camp. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I, I was like the last 14. Yeah. 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 There was one year where you were the final cut, right? Yeah. As yeah, well. Yeah. Was that 2011? That was when we played the qualifiers. Yeah. Yeah, I made that team. Yeah. Okay. And then the year after was the... And no, 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 sorry. I think it was 2010, was the European... That was the qualifiers, because yeah. that was when we did the yeah, back British yeah. basketball stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and you were there. Cause I was, I mean, yeah. was traveling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was silky. Um, so then, and in 2012, you didn't even get an invite to camp? No. Oh wow! Yeah. So and did, you, did did they contact you to say no, we're not inviting so you? What happened was I was in Cyprus and I was having a great year, and um, normally each year you get like a, a big package in the post, you know, where your fever forms and your asking about your health and your previous injuries and all that stuff. So I, I'm asking my mum like, oh, you, you get a, a, um, a package in the post? And she's like, no, I ain't got nothing. So I'm asking everyone, you know, Eric, Ogo, Matthew. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, like, I got my form. So I'm like, rah. So I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so I, I called, um, sorry, I, I messaged the guy, uh, Ron Rutula. Yeah. I'm like, you know, Ron, I ain't got my phone, blah, 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 blah. So he's like, oh, um, what's your number? I'll give you a call. So he calls me now, and then he's like, um, uh, all this small talk, like, he's nervous to say, say what it is, like, we're grown men, isn't it? He's like, um, oh, you know, um, you know, I can see you're having a great year in Greece, I mean, in Cyprus. Um, but yeah, you know, um, the, the coaches that just chose to go another direction with some younger guys. So I was like, okay, cool. Okay, if I said something fine, you know, I didn't take it personal. For, you know, for me, it was an opportunity to go abroad and see family in the Caribbean. It's my first free summer ever. Oh wow! So I went, went to um, Dominica, saw some family that I hadn't seen in like 10, 10 years. 
So I booked my flight now. Everything's paid for. So they're like, oh, um, by any chance, could you come to Houston? Obviously, <laughs> someone's got injured. Someone's dropped out. And now they want me to come. So I'm like, well, unless you can reimburse me for the money I just spent on, on a flight, I'll come. Didn't hear back from them. Oh, you know, so that's, that's that's just the way that they yeah, were doing yeah. things, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's so disrespectful. And there's there's other stories I I can tell you about them violating people. And like I said, this is not to bash GB because it's a new group that's involved, yeah. and they're totally different people. It's yeah. night and day, you know. Yeah. Even Joe Pranty was a good guy. It's night and day, you know. But that Olympic team, that pre Olympic stuff, yeah. yeah, they were they were different people, man. Yeah. Different, trust me. You know, obviously, if you're from the UK and you're, you know, you're rooting for for British basketball as much as as much as everyone else, um, did you feel like that the Olympics could have been the spark that you know helped really grow the game? And you know, when you look back at it, um, do you see it to be a missed opportunity? Like, kind of uh, being involved a little bit on on your side, like, yeah, kind of what are your feelings around around that time? Um, I mean, it's tough because you could say things have gotten worse since the Olympics, you know. The Olympics was supposed to leave a legacy and help grassroots basketball and get more kids involved in the game and then it's kind of gone the other way, you know, which I'm not sure what the reason is. Um, I'm not sure if it's people at the top or... I, I don't know what's going on, to be honest. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's a mess, you know. <laughs> um, and, and it shouldn't be, you know. I, I always tell people, look at France. France have a, a similar population size, similar demographic, and they're what top? What are they top five in, in the world? Top ten? They're like no, competing for medals in Europe every year. There's no know, excuse yeah. why the UK can't be as big as France, you know. And then you look at Spain, you look at Germany, you know. It's just like I, I don't know, man. And in, in all these countries, football is still bigger than basketball, but their basketball is light years ahead of us, you know. So it's a it's a shame, man, because we have the money for it, we have the space for it, you know, we can easily build the facilities for it, but, you know, like I said, who knows, is it people at the top, or is it the governing body, who who knows, who knows what it is, you know, to me it's all a bit confusing. Yeah. Um, and I hate to put it down to, you know, maybe because basketball is an inner city sport, you know, it's, it's a poor man's sport maybe, you know, so. I mean, you can, yeah, I mean, you can definitely make the case for institutionalised racism, I think, yeah, I think, yeah. uh, so, I think that's perfectly fair. I mean, it's funny enough. I, I've just when you were on the way here, um, there's someone I've been in touch with for a while. He's been writing a dissertation about um, basketball and the levels of funding that it's received over the years, and sort of the growth of the league and stuff. And uh, I mean, he's done such a good job of documenting the history. And when you read it like that, I mean, it's it's like 90 pages long. But when you read it there all together, and you realise there is just um, well, it's just a repetitive cycle. There is the same things that have been happening for years uh, and we never seem to learn from the mistakes. And I do think part of that is the, the lack of media that yeah. holds people accountable for things that aren't happening or, yeah. or, are, or are happening. Um, but yeah, I mean, no doubt it's incredibly frustrating for everybody involved. Uh, and it's just, it's just, it's like I never want to be that cynical guy. Like, there's just man. always bitching yeah, about British basketball. Real, but at the same time, that is the reality. It's yeah, just so easy to, to, to be that guy. The truth is the truth, regardless who it offends, man. Yeah. I mean, if you're telling the truth and people are offended, that's good. Yeah. It, it should be offended, you know. It, it's, it's supposed to sting, it's supposed to hurt. So, I mean, you, you should never feel, oh, I'm, I'm being that guy. The truth is the truth, man. If, if you don't like it, then yeah. make changes, you know. So, did your, so your experience with GB, um, you know, around that time, obviously then you had a period of not being involved for a fair, a fair while, right? Yeah, I think, I think it was... Uh, I think I played the, the next year with Joe Pranty. 2013, so that would have been Eurobasket. Yeah. yeah. And then, I think the, last, the next time was last summer. Yeah. 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 You, is part of that because of those early experiences and you're just kind of like, do you know what, I, I just don't want to do it or was so, are there other things going on? Um, um, to be honest, it was a, a, a mixture of that, to be honest, you know. You know, you, you start to feel, you know, why should I sacrifice my time away from my family, my kids, um, put my body on the line and you're not being appreciative appreciated or um, how can I put it yeah I mean if you don't feel appreciated or um, you don't see or you don't think people see the, 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 um, the value in you then what was the point of you investing yourself in something you know 
Um, but then also, you know, you, you know, you want your free time. You know, you want to travel. You want to, you know, go and see families. You know, so I mean, normally DB was like it was a long time. You know, it was like a whole summer was getting wiped out. You know, you you just, you're just away. But then recently, you know, they're they're doing shorter windows where it's like okay. It's only a week, you know, you're only with you know, my kids for a week or 10 days. So that's, that's realistic, you know, it's doable. And then, like I said, the new people that are involved, I'm not saying they're perfect, but they they try to at least make you feel wanted, you know. They speak to you a certain way, their tone is a certain way, you know. Um, when you're around them, you know, they don't make you feel uneasy or make you feel uncomfortable, you know. Um, so that helps, you know. And, and Last summer that I was there, you know, they, they treated me as if they wanted me there, you know, like, so, you know, that always helps, you know, the relationship you build with people. And then if there's no relationship, then there's no incentive to come back. And I said, I never had, I never had a conversation with Chris Finch or any of them guys, you know, in their mind, they're, they're here and we're here, you know, not, not everyone, but yeah. some of us, you know, so it's, it's all about how you treat people, you know, how people respond to you. If you treat people right, people will come back. If you don't, then people will be like, oh, that's for long, sure, you know? GB. Uh, yeah, I always felt that, um, especially in, in recent years, when there's been a lot of change with the with the staffing and stuff, it's like you need that one constant, almost like a relationship manager yeah. whose job is literally just to call out players yeah. throughout the yeah. years. Like, How's it going? You know, we've been keeping track of you, yeah. doing good or whatever. And I think yeah. that would do so much in terms of creating that goodwill with the players. But but yeah, it definitely seems like um, in terms of player relationships with the, with the coaching staff and and the players now is in a better I space than it has been you know in that. previous I years. Tell you that from my own own um, experience. Um, they're a lot better, man. It's it's night and day, you know. And yeah. How they even speak to you, like their whole delivery, you know, it's it's just, it's a a different culture, a different vibe that they're trying to build, you know. So, you know. are we likely to see you involved in the next window? Um, it's a possibility. Um, mm, I mean, a lot of stuff going on, you know, especially with with, with um with Jimmy passing. Yeah. Just trying to get my my headspace. You know, correct. Um, but it's possibility, possibility. I mean, I, I wouldn't say no to it. You know, I'd like yeah. to be involved. So, yeah, we'll see. Where do you see um, the future of British basketball? Kind of what you've seen with the BBL in the time that you've been around, uh, and then looking back to kind of where it was when when you were coming through and up to the present day. You know, what do you see the general trajectory? Do you feel like? Um, it's got a shot of ever reaching that sort of magical potential that the people always talk about? Um, or do you think that there needs to be some sort of uh, bigger widespread changes for anything to really change? Um, to be honest, I mean, even just this year alone, you know, you see the level of the league take a step up, you know. Um, Newcastle brought in some guys, you know, Leicester playing Europe, London City Royals, you know, you got us, you got Glasgow, you got, you got, all, you got so much talent in the league now. I think it can only get better, you know. Um, but like you said, I, I think something has to be changed from the top, you know. Um, I think if, if it has a chance, if it wants a chance to be like other leagues or, or be respected respected around Europe, you know, something has to change. I, I'm not sure if they have to find some big investors or some TV deals or something, you know, because British guys, they want to come home. You know, I, I speak to all of them. And, they, and if the money was here, they'll be here, you know, like there's nothing stopping them but the money, you know, so they, they have to find a way to get more money in, into the league, man, and just, just bring everyone home, you know, and just have a base where guys can feel comfortable, where they can come home, they can make enough money, earn a good living, you know, they can save, they can buy houses, you know. You know? Secure their future. Exactly, you know, like, like guys in France, French guys are making, Spanish guys making their money, you know. This is, this is the only only league where guys don't think they can come home and make good enough money, you know. So it's kind of like a um a brain drain, you know. Like you know, you see doctors leave Cuba or leave Haiti or you know that's what it's like now. It's, it's the, all the talent is, is gone, and then you need to find a way to bring it all back, you know. And that does become a vicious cycle, right? It's yeah, like if all yeah. of our best players aren't playing, exactly. it, then the exactly. game is going to struggle to continue to grow exactly. and, and develop. Exactly. Um, yeah. Talking talking about that, the the sort of um, I guess the financial side of things and the commercial side of things. You know, London Lions um, have the best arena in the in the country. Uh, they're in the biggest city in the country. Um, 
and you know still sort of struggled a bit with with crowds uh and i know this isn't your responsibility uh you just you know you, you turn up to play but kind of from your perspective as a player um why do you think that the lions maybe haven't resonated with the uh, sort of Newham population, like the, like we'd maybe expect. Um, what do you think the sort of general awareness is uh, in the area of the club, um, and how do you think that that can be changed over time to to try and get the cough box? You know, at least a good three thousand every yeah, single yeah, week. Yeah. Um, yeah, kind of. Yeah, what, what are your um, things about that? I mean, from just me being here a year, I can't speak on what happened before me. Or yeah, um, I would just say just creating stronger links with the community, you know, schools, um, you know, setting up shopping Westfields, you know, just having kids go around, you know, um, and I think there, you know, there's things that are being done, you know, that, you know, I spoke to them about, you know, some ideas on, on what, what they could do to kind of um, help, you know, bring in more crowds, you know, just giving away more free tickets, school kids, you know, like the other day we had, had a school, forget they were, where they were from, but they were, so loud, <laughs> their first game, you know, and they loved it. Um, but yeah, I mean, just to kind of sum up, I think just creating stronger links with that whole Newham area, you know, like you said, biggest arena is in Stratford. Um, Two minutes from Westfield. Westfield, you know, yeah, so for sure. there needs to be some some strategy where, yeah, you know. And again, I'm obviously, you know, some, some part of that comes down to money and having the money to yeah, do it but yeah. there's definitely other things I you know I always think that well you know I live here which is <clears throat> literally five minutes on a bus from from Stratford mm -hmm. um and I've never had a leaflet drop through my door yeah, saying yeah. London Lions exist um but yeah hopefully over time that you know that'll that'll continue to grow and I actually think with the Royals being there Funny enough, the interview I did with Ed Warner the other day, he was saying that uh, he thinks that there might be too many teams in the league, and actually, if they went smaller and just went higher quality, uh, you know, he's like, if, if the copper box can't be filled, you know, why can we have another franchise in London? And you know, I, I actually feel differently. Where I, th I think that the interest that the Royals has generated, then having that London derby, um, definitely makes it interesting. Definitely, you know, definitely. I think everyone's got their eye on the first time that you definitely. guys sort of will meet up. Um, but yeah, it, it is a tough one. I and I, I think that. Uh, if if there was a simple answer, then exactly. we would have a solution. Exactly. You know, we're here years later, exactly. and it's still still very much the same situation. And I think also, I just don't think obviously there's interest, but I just don't think the interest is that high. Like I don't think people value basketball in this country. Hundred percent. You know, so it's it's tough to. I mean, I don't know. Is it tough? I, I mean, I, I don't know. It is tough in in my opinion because you know most of these kids are into football or. Or whatever they're doing on the street, you know. So, but at the same time, it's like I said, you you gotta find a way to kind of spark that idea, you know, basketball, you know, entertainment, dances, halftime performances. It, it could be anything to kind of draw people in, you know. Um, who knows? Maybe that's like celebrities shouting shouting out teams, you know, or come down to the lines or yeah. whatever, you know. All these little ideas that can that can um invite people, you know. So. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I'm trying to think whether there's anything else uh, that is worth covering. I'm just going to have a look at my... There was a, uh, going back to the Brixton days, there was actually one more thing that I did have to write, write written down, um, was Jabbar. Uh, uh, I feel like he gets often overlooked, him, but he's a, he's a big part of the Brixton puzzle. Um, yes, yes. So can you kind of well, tell us how he fits into the puzzle, like what, what he is to Brixton and what he did uh, for you com coming up? Yeah, um, Jabbar, yeah. He's another one, man. He's another one. Um, him and Jimmy, they, boy. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to even to kind of describe that dynamic because, like, they were kind of like yin and yang, if that makes sense. Like, Jimmy was like the militant army run you into the ground, um, hold you accountable, um, always on you and always like challenging you mentally, you know. But Jabbar, he would get you in physical shape, man. Like he used to bring some, he's from Iraq, in it, so, and he played like in like Soviet Union, Yugoslavia. So he, 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 he was so creative with all the drills and, and like, to be honest, it was him that got us like, in terms of like doing the skill work and like, vertical leaps and you know athleticism he, he used to he used to do some crazy stuff man like 
there was a draw in Brixton, everyone in Brixton, we call it 51. Do you know what? Funny enough, when I spoke to Baby this morning, <laughs> he said, ask him about 51, hey. ask him about 51. Listen, man, listen, Jabbar, man, you have to do 51 and just have eight people with two balls. So have four here, four in this room, four in that room. And he put three benches in the middle. Three benches. You have to jump and jump over the bench before you get Three benches stacked up. I'm telling you. <laughs> like, and... It was and it's, it's tipping, right? So it's tipping, yeah, 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 tipping yeah, yeah. it to each other off the like, backboard. It was, it was to the point where you, you actually believe that you can't do it. Like, you think it's impossible. And each time you drop the ball, Jimmy would add five. So 51 become 56, 61. And then there'll be times we go into the hundreds. So, like, guys would be throwing up. Some guys would be crying. Like, we used to do some crazy stuff, man. Like I said, like, like those guys had us to the point where if they said run through this wall, we would run through it. We wouldn't even question it. We wouldn't say why. We would just run, break all of our, all of them. Saying. So like, but yeah, man. But I, I think for me personally, Jabbar, Jabbar um, taught me how to like channel my emotions. Like that was the biggest thing, man. Because like, anyone that knows when I first come out, I, I, I was very, um, I was very like feisty, had an attitude, always upset, always angry at people. Like I would just like switch, you know, so easy. Um, Someone fouled me, I'll get upset, you know. And, and Jabbar used to always like pull me to the side and be like, yo, man, you know, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. And so he, he he definitely like channeled my emotions and taught me how to like suppress them, you know, like not completely, but to the point where, you know, like your body language is good, you know, you know you're carrying yourself a certain way and just not letting it affect your overall game, you know. So Jabbar was, I mean, like I said, a lot of people don't mention him, it's only Jimmy, 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 but. Jabbar was, he, he, he's, he's right up there, you know, like, in terms of our, our, our development on the court, Jabbar was just as important, you know, like I said, they were like a yin and yang, you know, they give you different elements, but they were both as important as each other, you know, um, but yeah, everyone forgets about Jabbar Kasim, man, listen, man, that's, hey, that guy is the, he's the wizard, man, the wizard of us, trust me. So, uh, we're kind of up to the end, so I guess uh, a final question, um, if you were to talk to uh, a young British kid who, you know, maybe 12, 13, 14 years old, who wants to be where you are now, um, what advice would you give them? What would you say to them uh, to try and help them achieve their goals? Um, I'd say you have to outwork everyone. Um, going to practice three to four times a week is not enough. You know, you have to put in work by yourself whether it be outside in the rain, on your estate, bouncing the ball against a wall, um, you kind of have to be like obsessed with it, you know. It, I mean, if it's really what you want to do, if you don't want to do it, that's fine, you know. You, you, you can talk a good game, but, you know, people can see by your actions. Um, also, I would say, listen to your elders, you know. Um, like growing up, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of older guys, you know, behind me or before me, shall I say. Um, to kind of show me the ropes and pull me up about like, yo, just what are you doing, man? Like, don't do that or don't do this. Um, and I, and I feel like, especially with that younger generation, there's a big disconnect, you know. And I'm not sure if that's because there's so many clubs and guys are spread out. And but I don't think there's enough older guys guiding these guys or or or, or giving them advice, you know. And and the fact that there's a disconnect, I think some of the young guys are reluctant. To speak to us, you know, and ask for advice or um, ask for a number and say, yo, can I call you sometime and, I'll, you know, so you can help me out. And then I'd also say just, just believe in yourself, man. You know, um, a lot of people, you know, they might say you're not good enough, you're too short, you're too fat, whatever. You know, just, just always have that inner belief, you know. Not cockiness, but, you know, the fact that you know you're outworking people should enhance your self-belief, you know, because you know you put in the work. Um, yeah, just have that inner belief, man, and just always believe in yourself, and just just don't let society or your friends or your family situation deter you off of that of that um, that road. You know, if you want to make it, it's, it's up to you, really. So yeah, it's a perfect place to leave it, uh, Justin. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute thank pleasure. Thank you for having me, man. Thank you. 